Good afternoon and welcome to Today on Bay TV. I'm Dana Morgan and I'm joined today by Swansea Councillor Will Thomas and of course by our very own Caitlin Harris. And Caitlin, I think you're going to take us through what's happened on this day in history. Absolutely, it's a really interesting day. Um, it's, uh, in 1975, it's the first episode of the sort of renowned comedy Faulty Towers. <laughs> so it was broadcast on the BBC. Uh, we do have a clip of it, so looking forward to that. Let's remind ourselves. Rancorous, quaffered old sow! My God, you're ugly, aren't you? If you're not over here in 20 minutes with my door, I shall come over there and insert a large garden gnome in you. Good day. I'm telling you, if the good Lord is mentioned once more, I shall move you closer to him. Now, please! I'm going to give you a damn good trashing! And if you give us any more trouble, I shall visit you in the small hours and put a bat up your nightdress. I'm going to send you to a vivisectionist. Basil! 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 <laughs> you know, I thought this was funny the first time around, but I increasingly find it funny because I run my own bed and breakfast. Oh, really? <laughs> and sometimes I have to say I am Mrs. Faulty. <laughs> and so, sometimes I really, really um, do feel for Basil Faulty. It's, it's an institution as a comedy. I mean, John Wonderful, Cleese, it? it's just, it's funny every time you watch it. It's just. You got a man well? <laughs> I'm afraid I have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and more importantly, sometimes I haven't got a man well. But anyway, that's another oh. story. Are you a fan? Yes, I am. Yeah, I was always surprised how, many, how little episodes they did. I think it was yes. only mm. six or eight or yes. something and like wasn't that. Yeah. He working with one of his wives. Oh, I yeah. don't know. Yeah. I think so at the time. Yes, um, but yeah, British comedy is mm. short but sweet. Yeah. It's always good. No, I think there was a, a, a huge focus of concentration. Mm. And I suppose there's only so many um, takes you, you, you can do on it, really. Mm. Perhaps that's the beauty of it. Yeah, it's... short and sweet, like you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, wonderful, wonderful series. <laughs> yeah, it was very uh, funny. As I say, I've, uh, I've come to appreciate it more and more. Mm. Right, what else have we got, Katie? Uh, in 1945, we have the Nazi... It's a bit of a shift... Yeah. From Faulty Towers, but we have the Nazi propaganda broadcaster, so William Joyce, so also known as Lord Haw Haw, he was actually executed today, so he was hanged on on tre for reasons of treason. Um, he was very active, obviously, a active British during World War II, t so promoting Nazi ideals in Britain, mm. so he was hanged for treason. Um, we have a clip which is a sort of satire of him from Second World War, so... Uh, I think we should see that, perhaps. Mm. Germany calling, Germany calling the British Isles. And what Germany isn't calling the British Isles is nobody's business. This is Lord Haw Haw, spelt with a, uh, with a hyphen, uh, of Hamburg, Ziesen and DJA. Hello, you bounders, here is the news, the nasty news. Food is so short in England that in order to prevent looting, it's being packed into balloons. Of course, you have to cast yourself back to those days. It was very, mm. very serious mm. times, wasn't it? But was he as sinister as... as... I'm not sure he was really as sinister. I mean, he, it, Nazi ideology wasn't specifically a German thing, mm. which uh, I think some people forget mm. <laughs> that how many people did sympathise with Nazi ideology um, in the UK, in America. Got quite a lot of the aristocracy. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, I think he was probably quite a threatening. Mm. Sort of, he was part of the upper class. He did have this commanding voice, um, which, is, again, is satirised there. Mm. Um, but, again, there was satire. Mm. People could laugh at it, but it probably was quite a... Fairly sinister thing. These things weren't much of a laughing matter, were they, Will? I don't think. No, I don't think so. Yeah, it's a scary time. And, uh, you know, you see some of these things repeating themselves maybe mm. in, in, uh, around the world now, don't you? And you just hope that we don't go down that path again. Really? And it's, it's, a, it's very worrying times, isn't it? Mm. But mm. it casts your, back, your mind back to what it must have been like in, in, uh, in World War II, and it's, um, it's mm. absolutely terrifying. Yeah, you can't imagine yeah. it, can you? Of course, Swansea, the three day blitz, and suffered as much as anyone. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I mean, I was even reading about the um, children who were taken out of the, uh, the cities, you know, and uh, evacuated, evacuated yeah. to rural areas. Yeah, and you can't imagine even the, the stress, let alone the parents still staying in the cities getting. Bombed, uh, you know, not having their kids and seeing their and kids for yeah two or three years, you know, off they go. You know, it's uh, there's so many things 
dimensions to war that you don't necessarily think about mm -hmm. that uh, even that you know not seeing your children for a couple of years i mean mm. are... and it did cause serious dysfunction within mm. families but then Absolutely. lives were at stake mm. and uh, ideas are from the nazi regime um it only became more horrible after the war when people actually found out what they were That's doing. Right, yeah. because people like Sir Oswald Mosley, I mean, they were very mm. pro, weren't they? And, mm. and uh, his wife was, I can't remember which of the Midfoot, was it the Midfoot mm. sisters was his yeah. wife? But like you say, I mean, they could black out the media back then yeah. far easier, couldn't mm. they, than... Mm. Mm. So... Yeah. Mm. But, yeah. Dangerous times. Dangerous times. Are we going to anything lighter? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, actually, we do have quite a lot of lighter. It was also, in 1970, the first... Uh, the first instance of Glastonbury, the Glastonbury Festival started oh, right. today on in 1970 and obviously it's just oh, grown and grown and grown. Uh, we have another video about oh, the us events. Up. Yeah, it will. <laughs> it's fantastic. Pound entrance fee. Write personally to Michael Evers Esquire asking for a ticket, then turn on, tune in and drop out with 1,500 other naked revellers somewhere along the ley lines of Avalon. Oh, OK. So apparently that was Glastonbury Festival in 1970. And things have changed a little bit since then. Things such as ticket price, which is no longer one pound, but a whopping five pound. Booking fee uh, and 220 pound for the actual ticket. And forget about writing letters. And of course it's become, like, like so many things now, mm. like the Royal Welsh and the Ersted, dare I put them all in the same category. Mm. It's very much a political platform now, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. For anyone, you've got to be seen to be there, whether you're yeah. um, uh, well, Shirley, yeah. Shirley Bassey in her yeah. diamond wellies or Jeremy Corbyn. You, you... No, it's... Yeah, I wasn't too happy about that, using that as a stage <laughs> myself, especially... You know, but you are a conservative. Yeah, that, that's true, but uh, accusing people of mass murder in front of a stage, you know, is mm. a step too far, in my opinion. But the, the festival itself, of course, it, mm. I don't think it's always so well known that Michael Eves is, is a, a serious farmer. He remains no, a serious he, farmer. absolutely. He was down in West Wales about six months or so, or maybe uh, time goes, doesn't mm. it, um, addressing the Farmers Union of Wales and talking to farmers and touring around farms here. Mm. And he's uh, quite a serious dairy farmer. So. Have you been to Glastonbury, either of you? Uh, not the festival. Well, I've been to the town, but not yeah. the festival. <laughs> Yeah. I can't uh, afford to, I sent my daughters. I, I, I used I, to work there, actually. Oh, did you? Did you? Yeah, on, the, on the festival, yeah. We used to deliver the soft drinks around the site. Yeah. So we had these oh. little vans and we'd go down um, about a week before and then drive all the soft drinks around to all the... Um, uh, the different uh, food fun. outlets. Yeah, it was. It was Any great. inside stories? Uh, well, we, had, we were allowed backstage because we had these passes yeah. which had let us... Um, uh, it was give us a quicker mm. route across the thing, so we went. So who uh, did you meet backstage? Uh, uh, I think I met Lenny Kravis and the mm. Cause one night. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we were in. Yeah, it was quite. Uh, it was quite good. But I, I was very young. I was 16, well, 17, that's, that's 18, and 19 when I worked there. That's isn't it? I didn't yeah. really know who anyone was. I was just you know enjoying myself. Yeah, it's pretty atmosphere. cool. It must have been amazing. Yeah, oh, I was. Yeah, and it was before the uh, the first couple of years I went was before they cracked down on the perimeter fence oh, right. so it was you, it was noticeably a lot lot busier mm. and then they put a press release out saying they had a new fence and it was being sec mm. more secure mm. and then after that it was noticeably a lot quieter so i think a lot of people used to get in for free over the fence they it's must a have. bit gentrified isn't it mm. it is getting yeah. like more and more expensive especially for younger people mm. who it's yeah as you said it's the age to go but younger people it. just can't sort of go <laughs> yeah. in um and yeah it's getting a little bit more and more commercial, yeah. but farm diversification to end all farm diversifications. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Well, what else have we got? Yeah, and again, speaking of lighter things from earlier on, uh, we have the first time in 1879 where the Blackpool Illuminations came on oh, for the first 1879. time. 1879. 1879. It was uh, known as artificial sunshine. So they sort of got these big <laughs> needed in Blackpool. I was there last week, the first time. <laughs> no, I had been there on a farmers' rally before, but I went with my husband and daughter. They went up the tower. Mm. I stood on the promenade and waved at them. But um, yeah. I went in to watch the ballroom dancing. Really? I was desperate again, I have to say. But um, yes, I, I enjoyed it because mm. it mm. wasn't my thing, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Have you been to Blackpool? I haven't actually, no. No, I'm sure a stag do might pop up there one day <laughs> or something. <laughs> it's a great attraction, I think, this time of the year on, mm. isn't it? With the, I really yeah. admire the way they've sort of reinvented themselves with the illumination. I, I mean, it's turned. Uh, sort of as a fe it's almost a festival itself mm. now of sort of celebrating the city and celebrating the town sort and of the people i have to mm. say the people in the shops on the promenade and the cafes they are so friendly mm. Mm. Oh, you're a chunk. 
Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was wonderful. It's a local lingo, is it? Yeah. <laughs> very, very windy, though, and I can see why they needed um, mm. artificial sunshine. <laughs> well, I mean, it's grown bigger, obviously, since the, uh, since the 1870s. I mean, the choice so of peers. You've got three peers to choose from. Three peers. Three three on days, the north and the middle. There we go. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you very much. Next up, we'll be taking a look at the newspapers and chew in the cud.
Welcome back to Today on Bay TV. I'm Gaynor Morgan, and still with me are Swansea Councillor Will Thomas and our very own Caitlin Harris. And Caitlin, I think uh, this is my favourite bit, really. Yeah. You can take us through the papers, aren't you? Yeah, um, the thing that's dominating the headlines at the moment is the uh, Boris Johnson's 4,000-word essay on his... 4,200 4, words. 4,200-word <laughs> essay on his plans for a post-Brexit Britain. Mm -hmm. um, and lots of that is the, the headlines such as The Telegraph and The Financial Times have sort of been talking about uh, the divide potentially between Theresa May and Boris Johnson in the Brexit negotiations. And, and, and Hague is saying uh, May must unite Tories. Well, it's yes. really not in her gift, is it, Will? <laughs> um, I, I think uh, Theresa May is obviously the, the Prime Minister. I think Boris Johnson's fully mm. aware of that. Um, I don't that's personally... That's why you wrote the essay, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I mean, I... I I, don't th I think he's just a passionate Brexiteer who wants to get his opinion across. Very generous. Foreign, <laughs> foreign Secretary, so he's quite yeah. entitled to do so, in my opinion. Um, uh, I think Theresa May's doing a fantastic job since the election. Um, obviously, we had some uh, issues during the general election, but I think, uh, you know, she's... She's commanding, you know, her troops. Yeah. On a serious note, mm. as a Conservative councillor, yes. do, do, do you find it difficult to, to cope with what's going on, really, um, with the Brexit negotiations or not going on? Um, I'm, I'm a, personally a Brexiteer. Mm. I'm, uh, I, I think we're a trading nation and we'll do a fantastic job on our own. There's some negotiations whether we could still be part of the customs union, for example. I mean, that's, that's up for debate. Um, how difficult is it to sell to your constituents? Uh, it's it, it's straight down the middle. It really uh, it showed that in the um, you know in, in the in the polls. Mm. Uh, it, it really is. I mean, you, you, yeah, on the on the doorstep. Like yes, I mean during the election um, on the doorstep, it really was just. Mm. Uh, uh, what are the demographics? Complete. I don't, no. I don't think so you there really have is. You'd students and older people, wouldn't you? Yeah, I, I think it really is a, just a straight down the middle of all, all spectrum. From my experience, <laughs> you speak to someone who might think might be a Brexiteer and they're not, mm. and then it's just you just don't know. Mm. You don't know. And I think both sides need to remember that, and it is straight down the middle. It's 50-50 of the country. Well, 51, you know. It's very, very close... Uh, it was a very... What um, about Sir Vince Cable? Isn't he calling for a second referendum? He is. What yes. do you think of that? I think it undermines democracy. Do you? I do. Why? I think, well, I think we have voted to leave, and I think we should, the people should be listened to. So Boris has got his figures right. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, there's an even debate within the, um, the National Statistics Office, isn't there? No, Caitlin, I think, you've been... I think, a, li I think a little bit. There is debate in National Statistics, um, and in terms of... Boris Johnson and Theresa May. I mean, there are lots of people who are commenting, um, commenting on this essay. I mean, Amber Rudd has re talked about it on, on Andrew Mars. Andrew Mars yeah. So we have some video of that as well. Oh, do we? I oh, think we do. Thing. So I think uh, be nice. I did watch the the whole thing. <laughs> so we'll just see the clip now that you've picked for us, Amber Rudd. All right. Thanks. Can we move on then to another subject which we had spent a lot of time talking about, Boris Johnson. Have you read his 4,000-word piece? Uh, unfortunately not. I had rather a lot to do on Friday. There was, um, you know, a bomb that nearly went on, off, as we know, in Parsons Green. Yesterday I chaired Cobra. I went to see the police. I went to see the operation. No, I didn't have time to read that piece. Ruth Davidson has suggested the timing was a bit odd in that case. Do you agree with her? I think she has a point, yes. Um, you know, I had a very busy weekend dealing with what could have been a terrible attack on our public. Of course, there are all mm. suggestions that he wrote the essay so that he wouldn't be the Brexit fall guy, but who knows? Mm. He must have felt passionately about it because he's not known for keeping to his deadlines. <laughs> we'll see. Yes. Well. So, what, what so moving going? away from politics a little bit, uh, uh, other headlines that are dominating the news is the... Issues with Ryanair recently. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, they're sort of showing up in the Metro and the Daily Mail, primarily in the headlines. And Daily, uh, Ryanair has announced that they are cancelling 40 to 60 flights a day until October, 30, until October 31st. Look at the headlines. Can we see the yeah. headlines on 
perhaps from the, was it the Metro? The Metro and the Daily Mail. Yeah, there we go. It's a flight old mess. I mean, yeah. I know it's serious, but you've got to laugh at the headlines. I mean, it's a flight old mess. Yeah. The telegraph will be a bit more sober. Oh, the Daily Mail, flight mare, another take on that. Yeah. Nice picture of uh, Trump and Boris, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> And I think Jeff, our studio manager, is a little bit worried because he's off to Tenerife at yeah. some point. So yeah. he's hoping he'll get his flight. And people are trapped, well, basically. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it sounds funny, doesn't it, to be trapped in a sunny climate with a cocktail? Yeah, you've got to get funny. back to work, haven't you, and uh, yeah. see your family and other it commitments. Funny, but it's over four hundred thousand people. And also, you'd have, have to pay. You'd have to pay for mm. another for a few nights or whatever. And for me, it's third or fourth day on holiday. I'm desperate to come home again. <laughs> I'm a real homesick. It's just people get stuck yeah. in airports. Well, yeah. that's the thing. And um, again, we have a clip about people who are just sort of trapped. Yeah. And how much they have to pay to be able to get back home. Oh yes, it, it's um, very worrying. Perhaps we can see how they feel. We're about halfway through. And it's been a really frustrating experience. Frustrating and costly. We've had to pay out hundreds of pounds extra to book another hotel and also extra flights to get back. And the communication from Ryanair has been absolutely atrocious. We don't even know why it's been cancelled. We're just really desperate to get home now. We managed to get flights to John Lennon Airport, Liverpool, at the cost of £1,500. We then had to get a taxi at the cost of £100 back to Manchester to collect our car for our final journey home. Ryanair are an absolute disgrace. I have to say on the scale of things that aren't life-threatening or deadly serious, being trapped away from home like that mm. would freak me out. I, the thing is, um, it is costing people quite a lot of money mm. and Ryanair is, they've, in, they've admitted that it's their mess up as a they company. They messed up. Yeah, they just, they messed up, that's their line. Mm. Um, but they aren't... They will compensate people within EU regulations, but they've stated that they won't pay for people to fly on rival airlines. Oh, right. So, mm. Isn't it if they give people a flight within a fortnight, or they mm. need a flight within a fortnight, they don't have to pay or something? Something like that. They, uh, th there are EU regulations on it, they are following that, but so not a lot of compensation. Like to, I wouldn't like to be the person who messed up the whole Euro no. 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 It's also a lot of hassle for people reclaiming, mm. you know, all, the, all those things mm. as well. And a lot of people haven't got a couple of hundred pounds to, mm. you know, book those extra flights and pay for the next You wouldn't need to go on holiday, would you, living in Langland and Newton? Where it's do you a very, very lovely place to live. Yeah, Langland, yes, mm. yeah. Glorious, yeah. I'd have thought. Yes, yeah, very nice, very nice uh, part of the world, as is uh, mm. a lot of the Gower. And I dare say it's got its issues like anywhere else. Yes, there is, yeah. I mean, I think uh, a lot of people wrongly assume that um, the area's full of wealthy people. Oh, it looks pretty plush. It, it, it's a, it, well, I mean, we look after it uh, to our best of our ability. All the residents are very, very good at that. You know, there's lots of community groups and we've actually got uh, Keep Langland Tidy Action Group as well, which uh, sort of meets once a month mm. to um, pay extra attention to, uh, extra attention to the beach and that mm. sort of thing. And we do litter picks and cut the hedges back since the council cuts to the areas. Uh, Spending, so. It's got some very, very expensive houses, and I think Catherine Zeta-Jones is a resident, isn't she? Uh, yeah, more like round Lime Slade mm. uh, sort of way. Mm. She she uh, has a house, yes. Yeah. There's a mix of society, is there? Yeah, yeah, there is, yeah. Yes, um, yeah, there's complete cross-section of um, society. Yeah, it's not by no means at all like anyone who thinks that it is just all wealthy people needs to just, you know, come and... It's always been a bit up market, though, hasn't it? Just ha hasn't uh, I mean, th there are some lovely, lovely houses there. We're looking over the beach and obviously those houses are very expensive these days, yes. Mm. But there are lots of houses in, uh, in Newton which, uh, you know, don't, uh, aren't big five bedrooms looking over the sea. Are the there any majority. big local issues that are pertinent simply to Yes, there are. Um, there's uh, a couple of things. I mean, the council are currently exploring the option of selling off the, the double tennis court down Langland. Um, which... Controversial? Yeah, very controversial. It's, in my opinion, I know obviously the council's budget's tight at the moment, but I don't think selling off sports and recreational assets is, is the answer. Well, especially, um, I suppose, in an age where people are trying to keep trim, keep healthy. Exactly, yeah. Mm. yeah. The, um, you know, the, the Future Generations Act as well, they have to bear in mind that as a legal responsibility. Um, but it's such a sensitive area. I mean, Langland Beach is a stunning tourist yeah, destination with, and the, the tennis courts are part of the history of the beach. Mm. Um, 
Well, a plan of the community council, Mumbles Community Council, we hope to take the courts off the council um, and recover them and bring them back to life. And, and run them as a community. Yeah, that's right, yeah. It's, it's hmm. one of the proposals we're hopefully going to put forward. I think it's you. another team trip, Caitlin. <laughs> down to yeah, yeah. Like tennis. We play doubles. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, when we come back after the break, we'll be joined by Joe Bayliss of Swansea Fringe Festival and Lyndon Jones. See you then.
Welcome back to Today on Bay TV. I'm Gaina Morgan and I'm with Joe Bayliss of the Swansea Fringe Festival and Lyndon Jones of the Swansea International Festival. And I've got a new chair, guys. I keep <laughs> swinging round and <laughs> distracting everyone. <laughs> Lyndon, with you first, the, the, the Swansea Festival. I, I thought we just did it yesterday. I know, it's quite scary, isn't it? But li at least we're both looking younger and <laughs> healthier than ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, yeah, I, I can't quite believe it either. Yeah, it's... It's slightly terrifying the way it comes around. Yeah. Now, now, what's the connection, Joe? You, you, you're connected. To... So I did um, I did an event as part of the International Festival last year, um, mm -hmm. part of a music in the round sort of thing with Mal Pope in um, Volcano Theatre, yeah. uh, myself and another couple of sort of musical acts. Um, and then we sort of got chatting and thought it might be a nice yeah. idea to bring back the Fringe. And I mean, the Fringe. Ever since I started with the festival. People have been on me saying, oh, when are you going to restart the Fringe? When are we going to restart the Fringe? And the Swansea Fringe back in the 1980s um, started the careers of people like Paul Merton. All oh, right. And um, so there was, there's, there's always been this kind of desire to kind of get it going again. And so this year I kind of took the plunge. And the brilliant thing is I, I've, um, I've got a partner in crime now, which is great. So. <laughs> but Joe, it's, it's, a, it's slightly separate, isn't it? That sort of fringe was literally on the fringes of this. Well, I mean, it, it's always, it's difficult to know quite what model you kind of go, you follow. And in Edinburgh, for instance, which has got the most famous fringe festival of all, um, the, the fringe festival kind of kicks things off and then they go into the, the, into the posh festival, as, as they call it, you know. So who better so, to follow? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, and and look, it was an exp it, it, it's an experiment. We, you know, it, so far things are going really well, but you know, it we're having to kind of commit resources to it and all the rest of it. So, after talking to Joe, it seemed like the best way to do it would be to try and pack it around a weekend, mm. which is also the weekend when the students come back. Mm -hmm. It's also the Swansea Big Weekend. So there's a lot going on in town anyway. And we just thought we'd try and make it the kind of opening, if you like, of the main festival. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it goes well, well, next year it'll be even bigger and even better. You so, know. Joe, how different is the Fringe from, from the International Festival? I, I think it's a, a fair stone's throw. You will spot the um, difference. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it just, <laughs> it's just a... I think it's a, a different kettle of fish yeah. entirely, really, yeah. isn't it? Um, it's a little bit more anarchic. I mm. guess um, the the international festival is is a very formal series of events, really, isn't it? Um, whereas what what the fringe is sort of catering to is is the people that would rather a little bit more of a freeing atmosphere, I guess. Mm. Um, music venues, pubs, yeah. clubs, uh, independent cinema. Is it uh, so cinema music? Uh, we've got uh, we've got music events. We've got lots of music events, just purely because I, I come from a musical background, so that's sort of what we focused on. But we've got we try to get as much in there as possible. So we've got comedy, we've got poetry, uh, we've got some film events, um, uh, competitions. We've got some sort of ping pong tournaments. Anything, <laughs> anything really. There's whiskey tasting. Whiskey tasting. Yeah. Yeah. Put that on for me a bit. <laughs> <laughs> when does all this begin? Uh, next Friday. Ah, oh, lovely. Uh, as you say, a week on Friday. Friday. A week Friday. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah a week yeah, Friday. A week That's Friday, the one. yeah. And then when does when does the, the international festival well, kick in? We've we sort of um, mutate from the fringe into the festival because on the Sunday we've got um, an amazing old avant-garde saxophonist called Evan Parker coming along on the on the Hence your logo, I love that. Yeah. Brochure. That's right. Yeah. And um, and then it sort of kind of develops from there, really. So it picks up momentum around about Wednesday. Uh, I've got Ellen Manahan Thomas coming, and she's going to sing the world premiere of a brand new piece of music all about Swansea. Oh, right. Um, and that's about all I know about it so far. Uh, and then we've got the BBC National Orchestra of Wales on the Friday night. And if you just look at swanseafestival.org, you'll find out all about it. Mm. It sounds quite highbrow, is it? Well... Uh, no, <laughs> no. So you mean I can go? No, it's, yeah, of course you can. Um, I think a lot of these things, orchestras have this kind of, people think of them as being highbrow. You go to Italy, for instance, and like everybody goes to the opera, you know, it's a because it, culture, it, it though, gets yeah. it gets you it gets you right there in the heart. That's what it's meant to do. Yeah. It's not about um, you know being all kind of uh, highfalutin and intellectual. Um, when this music was written. It was written to move, move your heart and your soul. Mm. You know, so so it's. 
I, I can never stop saying how important it is for people to understand that it's not it's not some kind of um, esoteric activity. You know, it's it's to make you feel a better person, and you will. Mm, but you've also got some interviews, talk shows, as it were. Yeah. You've got um, Lord Heseltine in conversation yeah. with Jamie Owen, for example. Yeah. Um, I mean. It was it's about gardening as well as politics. Yeah, well, the thing is, now, the, 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 what, and he what, grows brought, trees. what brought this to my attention was that he's got this, um, he and his wife have got this amazing house in, I'd never been there, in Northamptonshire. Of course, he's Swansea born, we must Yeah, well, he was. Yeah. He was born in, born in Swansea. Um, and, you know, the most successful Swansea politician of the last 50 years, without a doubt. And always in, you know, I mean, you might not agree with him, but he's always interesting. And, yes. you know, he's, yeah. he's not going gentle into the night either. You know, I mean, he is kicking up a hell of a stink about Brexit, Brexit and so yeah. on. And, uh, and also, you know, he's had this book out about all the kind of love and care that he and his wife have um, invested in this garden of theirs. And it just suddenly struck me because Corbyn, Corbyn is also, you know, he's, he, what he likes more than anything else is to be on his allotment. And I just thought there's something about politicians and gardening. And I just hope Jamie's going to kind of ask him about that and say, does it make you a better politician? So do Labour leaders have allotments and Conservative leaders have well, arboretum? Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but he has seriously planted oh, thousands, yeah. thousands of trees, yeah. I think. So that should be an interesting one. But I think I've picked out some more. Um, I, I always like the talking. Um, yeah. the, it's Friends Festival Talk. Yeah, I mean, Johnson, an, old, an old pal of mine from when I used to work at the BBC, Stephen Johnson, who he's... He, he, he sort of... He was a music critic, I suppose, first and foremost, then and a broadcaster, and he's also started composing now as well. But in, through all of that, he's actually had quite a few episodes of depression, and he's actually talked about it publicly and written about it. Yeah. So, so actually, he's going to come and give two talks. He's going to give one at Morrison Hospital, which is about um, his new book, which is how Shostakovich changed my mind, which is about how music can help with depression. Mm. And then at the f at the other at the Friends Festival talk he's sandwiched between two piano recitals so i think he's going to talk about piano music and um something to, i don't know exactly oh, yet but he's a really really nice guy really interesting guy what does it take out of you to 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 organize it to stage it i mean it, it's phenomenal you've ruined everything i said we were looking younger <laughs> it's, well, i couldn't it's, organize my way of a paper bag so. it's, <laughs> it, it, no it is pretty hard work actually I, mm. you know i won't i won't dodge it and, and dear joe here has been slogging his guts out i've know. lost all my hair since yeah. i've well. flowing have locks down to a bank <laughs> so here -ish. Um, yeah. how long have you been planning it uh, probably well, about four months, five yeah. months, maybe. Well, I mean, you began. The, I remember you saying at the end of the last festival, you were thinking about the next one. Oh well, I've already booked quite a lot of stuff for next year. Oh, have you? You know, I mean, that, you no, know, you've got to. For punishment. Not, probably not enough because you know, I mean, orchestras, diaries, you know, are things that mm. you, you know, you, you you can't just pick any date. So, and yeah. of course, he's a world figure. Some of them. Yeah, absolutely. What makes it distinctively Swansea, and not just any old festival you could have anywhere? Well, I mean. It's, I mean, I try to balance up three things. I try to balance up an international thing, a national thing, and a local thing. Mm. And I hope that what you'll find is evidence of all of those three things in what I programme. So, you've got Ellen Manhattan Thomas, who's born and raised in Swansea, who is, you know, one of the world's top sopranos. Uh, she's coming to do something at the festival. Tom Carroll, um, you know, again, in demand as a cello soloist all over the world. He now runs his own orchestra. They're coming to the festival for the first time. Mm. Um, Claire Williams, you know, one of the finest Welsh pianists of this generation, he's coming to the festival. And then we've got orchestras coming from St. Petersburg. You know, so, so what I try and do is, is locate Swansea on an international mm. stage and use Put all those elements together. To and how much of a draw is, is it um, to, to people when you approach them? Some of these top-line international authors. Do they have they heard of Swansea well, Little London Festival? Is it a hard sell? Sometimes they have, sometimes they haven't. And I think what they all go away with is an incredible sense of what a warm, friendly, and welcoming place it is. And that's certainly what I care about: is that they get a warm welcome when they get here. They get well fed. They get looked after, and then they go away, and they tell their mates what a great time they've had. And Joe, just very briefly, in a few seconds, what do you want the fringe element to be remembered for? Something a little bit different from that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and the beer and the songs and the pubs. I I, I think 
it'll just be lovely to see people coming along to it now and supporting it. It's uh, it's been a it's been a long time in the in the making, so it'll be nice to see people coming along. Yeah. So well, you put in a lot of work, both of you, and I suppose this time next year we'll be saying, "Gosh, yeah, 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 yeah. come around again." But thank you so much for coming thank in, you. both of you, and joining us on the show today. We we'll look forward to the festival. After the break, I'll be joined by author Jem Vanston. Look forward to that.
Welcome back to Today on Bay TV. I'm Gaynor Morgan, and with me is author Jem Vanston. And Jem, you've uh, you brought out a, a new book, a sequel. Yeah. It's called A Cat Called Dog Two. Two, yes. A, a Cat Called Dog Two, the one with the kittens. <laughs> right. It's got three kittens in it. I mean, it is a sequel. It can be read as a standalone book. You don't have to know the first book to enjoy this one. Um, well, for, why is your cat called Dog? Uh, he was brought up by dogs. So he's got a. He's, people say they remind him of a, a teenager or a young teenager, a child, um, trying to find his way. Um, but he he yaps and he barks and he wags his tail when he's happy and he has to learn how to be a cat. And of course, that is what happens, it. isn't it? If if an animal is. Uh, I think so. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm not I'm not an expert on that. You just I mean, made it, it is up. fiction. <laughs> but um, it was it's sort yeah. of inspired. Some cats do. I mean, they're supposed to wag their tail when they're angry. Mm. Cats. I mean, I've been brought up with cats, so I know the mannerisms well. I'm trying to get into their heads. Oh, you can't. Um, can you? But uh, <laughs> you can you could make a good a good effort. But uh, you know, when a cat wags its tail, it's supposed to be angry. Oh. And when a dog wags its to tell it's supposed to be happy, happy but there, yeah. there are cats who we have one now mm. bumble who wags his her tail to her we call me mm. <laughs> but um wags the tail when uh, she's happy so um is that in the book or in your no, home it's life in, in the home life yes there's a real cat so cats do uh do you have a spillover between the book and your home life? yes it's definitely there's one cat here eric who's at the front there the uh, the stray cockney stray yeah. he's got a big bushy tail i take that from my cat at home uh, definitely, there's a a, a, a cat that uh, speaks with a French accent, although I don't mention nationalities in the book. This one is a little bit based on our cat Honey, mm. who's very sort of wise and keeps a lot to herself. So how do but, we uh, know that she speaks with a French accent? Uh, well, I don't. This is getting curious. I don't, and curious, I don't mention nationalities or places or names in the in no, books to be universal. No, you to don't. Make it universal. But it's got a Welsh sort of feel, hasn't it? Ow, yowled Eric. That hurt that day. So you can imagine anyone yeah. in Swansea saying that. It's uh, it's set in Swansea and in Gower. Oh. I don't mention the names of Swansea and Gower, but it goes from my backyard in Uplands, basically. Oh, I suppose, are we, um, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. The French, yeah. Yeah, the Fr yeah. I mean, you can um, you can convey an accent. There are two uh, Hollywood film star cats. Oh, yeah. Um, one based on Christopher Walken, Christopher the Dancing Cat, right. who's a cat lover. Yeah. And a great cat lover and good dancer. And Doris is a little bit based on Doris Day. But again, I don't say they're American cats. I don't even use the word Hollywood. Just let just it convey through. it through yeah. Uh, I'm a former English teacher as well, so that helps mm. <laughs> to do the accents, uh, various accents, the Hollywood accent and the Cockney accent and things like that. Now, this is aimed for seven-year-olds, but grown-ups can enjoy it. Uh, it's aimed, I would say, it's uh, most of the fans are adults. You know, it's like a Disney film in that it appeals to adults and kids. Um, I mean, the cover does look more like a children's book. Um, and there are children, I know, the, the youngest I know is his grandfather reads it to a six-year-old who really oh, loves right. it. Yeah. Um, I'd say the more able Did primary school, <laughs> there we are, the that's, one that's the one. one. Yeah. The more, um, the more, really more able, um, more able primary school children could read it, I think. And somebody said to me in the most recent review that Dog himself is a bit like a young teenager, so it could appeal to teenagers. But yeah, it's very much uh, um, the kind of book, I was listening today, something about Wind and the Willows. It's a bit mm. like that. It's because uh, the animals have such character and they've got such human characteristic and animal characteristics, and it does appeal to adults as well. And that's his biggest fan base is adults rather than children. But it does, as I said, it's like all ages uh, would enjoy as, it. As a former English teacher, mm. you know, you're writing for children, but how, how concerned are you to keep the, the sort of grammar grammatical, as it were, you know? Yeah, I mean, this is a big... losing the entertainment value. This is a big issue these days. Um, I, I know, for example, that when they reissued Beatrix Potter mm. um, stories five years ago, quite disgraceful. Gracefully, they took out some of the big words, mm. which I'm totally against that kind of dumbing down. Mm. They took out things like obstreperous and somnolent, meaning and sleepy. And I was against her ethos and, um, as well. I visited her farm oh, right, in, yeah, the, yeah. Um, in the Lake District, Lake District last yeah, week. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. And she was quite a serious writer and, and artist. Well, I think, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I remember nine years old reading Professor Brainstorm books. There's mm. proper sentences, mm. subordinate clauses, yeah. long words. And I think it's a real insult to children to take mm. out words. I mean, yes, some children won't get them. Mm. Um, some adults won't get them, and 20% of adults can't read and write very well, and 40% of adults can't count. Yeah. So these are these are pretty bad mm. things, but that doesn't mean you dumb everything down. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm very much in favour of wising up 
rather than dumbing down. And a word like obstreperous, which I deliberately put in this book because they took it out of Beatrix Potter. Mm. So I deliberately put it, it means sort of bolshy and noisy and mm. resisting, a child resisting a mother being obstreperous. I deliberately put it in here because Beatrix Potter put it in the, I think the Flopsy Bunnies or maybe Peter Rabbit mm. being obstreperous. And But the, five years ago when they re-released them, they took it out. Oh, no, no, it's too difficult yeah, for children. Yeah, you know, yeah so. we were always taught, well, you, mm. you get your dictionary out or you ask your mum or you ask Learn the from teacher. the context. Yes. You learn the, the children, yeah. we all learn it's words absorbed, from the context. Yes, yes. And the, the attitude that, oh, we have to simplify everything everything to make it a lot of children's books nowadays are a bit like a cartoon strip with what i call goo goo gaga language mm. and that's they like that because everyone can understand it and even the children or adults who can't read or don't want to read they can look at the pictures i mean i sort of resist that i mean you see why they do it to make more profits because mm. they've got a wider base but of potential live, readers but um you know, the attention span is, is this shrinking. is true I, I would say that's definitely and, and true even yeah. i on text you know I, I i do pick my daughters up sometimes when they're <laughs> facebooking me or something and they're not using the correct grammar yeah. and they say yeah. well you don't need that on facebook or yeah that. i mean it's uh it's a slippery slope isn't it if people say if people ever say you know it's not uh, it's not important learning how to spell because you've got spell check oh, but you need to know how to spell to use spell yeah. check and people say oh it's not important it's funny but you never find anybody who knows how to spell well who says it's not important mm. now if you if you learn how to spell well and you can learn proper english and use it properly and well mm. then you can say it's not important fine but if you just don't know how to use it and you say oh it's not important that's uh, that's <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, that's because you can't do it. Of course, that's why are, you don't think it's important. You know, I mean, yeah. there, are, there are issues. But, uh, such as it is, and things, yes, of course, of course. But sorry. it is it, it is quite easy to read. It's not difficult to read, but it's um, you know it's certainly a roller coaster of a ride. It's a real oh, yeah, quest. Okay. I mean, the three kittens are trying to find their mother who's been stolen by cat catchers. And so it's a quest story, which is one of the classic stories of going back yeah. centuries to to Aristotle to uh, Poetics 300 BC. It's one of his seven types of stories, and they go on an adventure. You know, through actually it's not named, but through Swansea and Gower, they go to a farm with an old Gower farm, which you know Gower farms with an old English sheepdog, and they go through a haunted wood, and they go to a big road could be the M4. They go to a film studios on Fabian Way, oh, um, okay. like the one you passed there, which you is. Didn't a, bring them in here. <laughs> Shame on you. Well, it's a it's a great way to get dinosaurs into the book, which I do. Uh, I think it's the first book ever with oh, kittens and dinosaurs in the in the in the same book but uh, the film studios was great it gives you as a device gives you mm. a lot of um, freedom especially as I've this year I've managed to um, do my first foray into the film industry yes. as a co-producer many talents I mean, what is this film that you <laughs> yes it's a film called chariots uh, directed by and written by uh, Rob Sermon mm. um, and I was there in uh, mumbles at the Austrian Center doing the filming for that with Bob Pugh who's a uh, well-known Welsh actor a lot of other well-known Welsh actors there is in famous for Game of Thrones internationally mm. now. And he was there doing a debate scene. I was, I was there on Wine Street in, in April. I was an extra in the film as well. It's all about a corrupt Swansea politician. Oh. <laughs> uh, you have a lot on here. I'm sure they're not corrupt, but, uh, mm. <laughs> but it's all about a corrupt. Uh, it's a mockumentary. Yeah, good guy. Very low budget um, mockumentary about a corrupt Swansea politician. Yeah, so that's, I think it's about- and When are we going to see this? Next year sometime. I mean, I think it's about 80% filmed. A lot of the actors have other projects, so they come out and Rob does the filming. Uh, I mean, I play a very minor role as a, as a co-producer uh, of the film, but uh, yeah, it's, it's so nice it's, to get involved with. Is it going with. to be one of these uh, that are streamed, or is it going to be- I'm on sure it'll be digital. I'm sure there'll be a cinema premiere in Swansea, oh, right. uh, maybe in London as well. I mean, it's obviously, uh, if you look at film and distribution, it's not going to be the to headlining in Leicester Square. Yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> It'll be, uh, yeah, near yeah. the time next yeah. year will definitely, Just I'm sure finally, people will come uh, on to... Know, as a man um, of many yeah. talents, how <laughs> difficult is it to creative, get creative work out there? You know, oh, it's, ex it's extremely um, difficult. I mean, this one I have a publisher with. The book I'm working on at the moment, which is a strict children's book, middle grade, I'm hoping to get a big publisher for that. That's mm. full of dinosaurs as well. <laughs> so I, I like dinosaurs, you but it is... give up then, you should pursue Well, I, I, I know the figures that 97% of people who start writing a novel don't finish it. Right. And of those who finish, only 20% get it published, self-published or otherwise. So uh, you've, one in 200 people who start a novel get it published, basically. So you need, you need, and of course it doesn't make much money as well. I'm so it's, uh, it is, it is tough. It's all, but it's always been tough. It's, I'm it's clearly it's, sitting know. by a very talented person. Thank you very much <laughs> okay, for joining all. us. Thank you thank so you. much. And thanks to all our guests today. Next on Bay TV, we have our afternoon matinee movie. Today it's the 1954 crime thriller, The Black Rider, starring Jimmy Henley and Rory Anderson. Mm.
Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. 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 Thank you.